Welcome back to another Supercoach and Fantasy video with me, JD. You're joining me post round one. Uh, we are in that magical period where the games are finished and lockout will probably take two or three hours. It's always the longest one of the year, um, this first round. So we are going to go through each of the games in this video, crank them out. Uh, will be relevant for both formats, and then I'll do my team update videos for uh, update videos for Supercoach and Fantasy as separate ones during the week. So if you just want to peek my team, feel free to to uh, move on. But if you actually want to listen to what I thought about the players and provide the analysis that the videos probably won't have in in detail, then we'll go through it. Uh, I like in this first round and hopefully the second round too to try and cover as many of these games as I can try and get through uh, pretty much all of them, uh, so I can give. My view, because effectively these first couple of weeks, especially for Supercoach, most important for trading. We want to make sure that we nail these picks. So, um, yeah, shall we get into it? I think so. Let's get into it. I don't know who I'm asking. I'm, I'm the only one here. So, um, starting off, we had the Blues against the Tigers, which uh, was another close one. Um, you know, really good from the Tigers to bounce back after a pretty disappointing last week. Where's my water bottle? As you know, we, we never read it. You will get all drinking ASMR as part of this. I really should have started. I, I shouldn't be needing to do this like one minute 30 into a video, but here we are. All right. So yeah, a good bounce back from the Tigers after a pretty poor effort against uh, Gold Coast showed a lot and they had injuries in this game as well with uh, Gibkiss, Young and Prestia all going down. So running a short bench for the second half and almost still getting there in the end. Uh, I thought Blues were the better team on the night, but, you know, given everything that went on, um, yeah, Tigers, very, very good effort in defeat. Uh, in terms of the side, so um, this little color coding key here is in blue are the ones that I've got like on my watch list uh, and the yellow are the ones that I own in some format. Uh, I probably haven't done all this properly and I'm probably missing some in blue as well, uh, but th these are the main ones I'm going to go through and then I'll talk about any other like one-off scores, should I consider this player, all that type of stuff. So on the blue side, I've got Makai listed there just because he's now had two big games back to back. I think like a 130 and a 110 super coach. Uh, so given that he hasn't risen, he is someone that you could potentially target coming off his buy for a couple of big price increases, as I believe they play North coming off the buy, and we saw Hogan go 160 on them today. So uh, yeah, just a, a sneaky little watch list says for, for a cheap cash play, you might jump off someone like a Fisher or something like that into him. Uh, but yeah, obviously he had two really good weeks back to back now, leading up at the ball strong. Um, you know, he's been good with his marking and most importantly been converting in front of goal. Uh, and even when he's been up the ground a bit more, like he's um, kicking inside 50, he's been, he's been good. So probably the best two game sample size I've seen out of his career. Very nice. Uh, Jack Carroll's one that found his way into my super coach side. So this is color coded wrong just before this game started. And I really liked what uh, we saw out of him. Once again, getting CBA rotations. I think he's was fourth in line. Might've got like 10, um, you know, outside of the Hewitt, Chera, uh, Cripps combo. Uh, so I think he was next in line from those four and then also played half forward a bit. I had periods we went in and out in this game, but overall really strong. And pleasingly, I think he's played himself into this side. He should hold his spot even when Walsh comes back. Now, what that looks like, I'm not sure. Uh, whether Walsh comes back at all, I'm not sure. Uh, the other thing that's nice as well is that uh, Kennedy, uh, who you know might put his hand up for Sevilla, actually thought he's looked really good as a forward, half forward type. Uh, and so he doesn't, it doesn't look like you, you would actually put him in the CBAs over Carroll, who's looked good in there. So positive signs, definitely a rookie for your watch list. 123k in Supercoach. In fantasy, not as relevant. Uh, I think he's priced already a lot higher, but yeah, one to one to think about. Williams, going to be a lot of questions asked about Williams. So, uh, you know, what do you do with him? In, in fantasy, I think it's pretty easy, like 74 hold. In uh, in Supercoach, that 51 uh, is a pretty annoying score, and especially with the buy this week and with Massimo putting his hand up, like, do you know, do you swap and all that type of stuff? I think for me, I'd like hold is the answer. Uh We've seen two weeks in a row now where he's had three quarters where he's scored and then the fourth he's faded away. So having basically two games back to back, then going on the bye, I think once he comes out of the bye, we should see him maybe pull, um, you know, a full game together. And I think he's actually looked pretty good. So I, I start, I imagine that these 74 fifties actually turn into eighties and, and stuff going forward. So I'm, I'm still pretty comfortable with Williams. I think he's looked good as long as his body holds up. 
Uh, Fantasia is one that will be no longer colored because he's not relevant. It was just whether or not he'd end up being a sneaky uh, rookie option. All right, uh, quickly, other things here. I mean, Hewitt was never on my watch list, but I know some people have picked him up. I think he is a trade, especially given his buy and he's put poor scores into his averages. So I'd be looking to move him on. Uh, and then like, you know, Cripps isn't relevant. Newman's not really relevant, even though he had a good game this year. And I think that the side's not really relevant. I think that's pretty much it. And Chero looks like he's not going to be relevant unless, I don't know, maybe a Cripps or someone goes out and he gets more. Yeah, I don't even know then. Maybe he might get cheap. Um, maybe his days of fantasy relevance will never come. Uh, on the Tiger side, so yeah, it's going to be interesting to see what happens with this side and how they restructure with Gibkiss and Young going out or having injuries. Young, I know, is just a concussion, but Gibkiss looks like it'll be the year because it's an ACL. Uh, they mucked around with throwing Bolter back into half, like center half back, and he dominated in both positions, both forward of the ball and behind it. He was probably best on for the Tigers. I mean, yeah, Nankovis and Blossom could also um, put their hands up, but Bolter was the most dominant force that they had on their side. So the interesting thing is like if they throw Bolter back to, you know, potentially cover Gibkiss or something like that, it opens up a forward spot. What do they do? Does that like would they bring in Naismith? Uh or would they try something else? That's a little bit of a wait and see with how they restructure on the back of that. Um I also wonder like what they do with Baker as well. Not that I think he's going to be relevant, but just um, you know, Thoughts out there. Uh, all right. And then, um, so yeah, Gibkiss obviously is a, is a trade. Um, the the problem is that like not many defensive rookies look very good at the moment. So where you trade him to, I'm not sure. It might be better to hold and wait and see. But yeah, that's a bit of a tough one. I'm really unfortunate for Gibkiss too, because I like him. Um, I guess the only silver lining for us as fantasy and super coach players is that we're going to get him cheap again next year. But I'd rather he be playing out there and being healthy. So yeah, it's a shame. And then Campbell was one that people have jumped on for a bit of quick cash gen. Uh, in Supercoach, he's pretty much already killed that with the 31. Um, I think you just wait one more week, get one quick price rise out of him, and then correct him. Uh, for fantasy, the 48's not as bad, and he probably holds given the injuries. He did have moments where he was good. I think like the first and fourth, he was pretty productive, but then went missing through the middle of that game. Oh, I cannot tell you off the top of my head who the Tigers play this week because I think that could come down to whether or not he ends up being uh, a good option. Let's see if I can quickly bring that up. Round two, the Tigers play Port. Oh, that's a bit of a worrying sign based on what we saw today. Uh, but yeah, if you, I think, I feel like Campbell's going to be one of those ones where people have probably got bigger issues in trading him out, but he is someone that you might uh, look to move on sooner than later. Uh, in terms of like Boltons, Martins, all that type of stuff, I don't think any of them are going to end up being primos. Uh, Short is the interesting one because he did have that halfback role, but, you know, definitely sharing it with Rioli. And uh, I think Blues have typically been pretty hard to, to score against, and we saw that in this game. So, you know, he was getting kickouts and he did have that role and he did kick a goal, but didn't quite put it all there together. Uh, I think he could still work out as a primo pick. And once again, I'm not sure if people will have the luxury of coming off him. Uh, so I think it's just a hold, but yeah, not what you want to see by no means. Uh, Taranto might be a sneaky watch in fantasy at some point, but I'd wait for his cash to come down. Don't think it'd be relevant at all in Supercoach. Moving on to the second game of the week, we had Sydney Swans pretty convincingly beating out the Pies 102 to 69. An enjoyable game to watch uh, just in terms of like style and how it all played out. Uh, where to start with this one? Uh, well, let's just go left to right. Otherwise, I'm going to gush over Heaney. Um, but George has done that enough for the whole community. So let's just focus on the, <laughs> the game as a whole as well. Uh, all right, so Pies, another little wobbly game from them. You can see the pieces are there in the making, but just not quite there. And having some of the injuries they've had probably hasn't helped. I think they'll bounce back. I still think they're going to be very strong. Um, but yeah, I mean, like they are the team that everyone's been studying over the preseason. They've faced two top four-ish or thereabouts probably sides for the year. Uh, I mean, I definitely think GWS and Swans are both top eight. Maybe they fall away across the year and they don't, don't make top four, but they're big contenders. Um, so kind of understandable as to why Pies might get off to a slow start, but not out on them by any means. All right, Nick Dacos was my vice captain in all formats. So 123 fantasy, 135 in Supercoach. We took both of those. Um, once again, didn't look like he had his best game and just finds scoring so easily. Loves the ball, high time on ground, uh, getting the contested possessions now as well. So... 
Uh, yeah, enjoyed Dacos' game. I think very hard not to own. Uh, and I do think he's going to end up being uh, like in, in upping his average again in all formats. So very happy with him. Uh, I mean, I think he's putting his case forward as to why, you know, potentially should be tagged by someone like the Hawks. But the real positive sign for me is they've lost two games now pretty convincingly. And Dacos hasn't been tagged in either of those games. So if I'm an opposition coach studying that, uh, there's actually ways to play this where you don't have to tag Dacos and you can actually get away with it. What I saw in the Swans game was just how they pressured um, and they weren't like necessarily running up to tackle when the Pies were possessing it, especially in midfield. They were kind of more playing like a zone keeping off style defense where they're up there and pressuring them within a few meters. So they couldn't kind of run past them, but they weren't committing to the tackle to allow like overlaps and all that type of stuff. It was, it was good. Like it was really good defense and the way they defended Collingwood. And I think that's kind of the blueprint for what other teams will do. I feel like GWS more beat them at their own style. Um, and we were able to pick apart the zone really well. And I think Swans showed a slightly different way you can actually um, pressure them coming out of defense and still be effective. And so that was that was interesting to see. Like they, you know, Pies can be a pretty high scoring team. So to get into to this is is very good. Um, so yeah, I, I think all of that though ends up being positive to Dacos because he can have 37 touches and a goal and them get beaten by, you know, convincingly. Um, so yeah, positive signs for Dacos owners. Might the Hawks or someone else still tag him? Sure. But I think there's at least blueprint that you can um, beat them now with uh, without focusing in on Dacos. Uh, Dean played his second game as a ruck and interestingly, Howe came back and he held his spot. So uh, one to consider, maybe more so in Supercoach with the lack of other options. I do wonder, uh, he's been okay, but not the best. And obviously they're now zero and two. So do they consider Frampton? I don't know what Murphy's concussion history is at, but I feel like he'd go out for Murphy straight away. They're kind of lacking um, someone like Murphy. Never thought I'd say that's a weird sentence. So yeah, a bit of a, a tough one there. I'm not sure I'll be bringing him in anywhere myself, but I could see people in certain situations considering Dean, especially you know, depending on what happens this week, if he still holds again. Um, yeah, one to keep an eye on. And then Finn McRae, obviously been on a lot of people's watch lists, but named sub, so no real interest there. Uh, I'd actually need to... Um, you know, continue to earn his spot and all that stuff. Uh, other things to quickly note, Dust Cameron been very good through two games, uh, you know, beat out uh, Grundy in this one, who a lot of us had. Um, so yeah, he's been doing well, but I'd like, I just, I don't know how anyone would have him given that almost everyone went Grundy, but yep, he's been good. Unfortunately, he doesn't have the forward status. And then really, oh, and I think he'd go even better if they dropped Cox, but I don't think they will. And then, yeah, that's pretty much it. A uh, bit of a depressing game here. Uh, for the pies anyway. Swan side, uh, yeah, loved what they did. And uh, Row Bottom, this was his best game. Like he top scored, best game I've seen him play. Uh, looked very good. You know, obviously opportunity there with some of the other inside mids out. And both he and Heaney, who we'll talk about, took that. Heaney, like I said last week, it was his best mid game I'd seen out of him. And uh, he backed that up again. It's easily the two best two games of him as a mid I've seen in his career which is positive signs and he's still going forward and kicking goals as well. And the forwards importantly clicked for them as well. Plus, you know, Warner can go forward and be a threat there as well. So it doesn't have to be Heaney. It's, it's really positive stuff. So two massive scores. Glad I own him everywhere. That is for sure. Uh, if you don't have him, is he a must have? I don't know. Like if you've got Flanders uh, and, you know, Flanders, uh, Jackson went well, you know, there's five, um, there's now Billings, which we'll talk about later. Uh, there's Jordan. Like, you're going to miss out on some of these guys, I think. So is he a must-have? Probably not as long as you've got enough of these other guys. It is going to be hard to get him, though. I think you just might be waiting out and seeing uh, if some of the other ones fade. I have a, you know, just general philosophy, which we'll talk about in trade videos and all that type of stuff. Like, we're still trying to maximize cash gen. Is getting Heaney going to give you the best cash gen? Probably not. Like, you could go Hogan or something like that instead. So... I don't think he's a must-have, but definitely a good option. He looks like he could be a keeper or thereabouts if he keeps up this form. Obviously, the full preseason has done wonders for him. Uh, Goulden, yeah, on a watch list. Like He's one that I'm hoping will get cheap at some point and jump on him, but had a decent game. Started very slow. I actually didn't think he was going to end up here. I thought he might sub-ton again, but it's fine. Uh, Jordan was good, continues to be good, doing enough at his price point will make us some quick money. And then I assume, uh, we'll be getting rid of him before the buy, you know, maybe someone like Flanders coming off it, although that could be, uh, 
um, Fisher with the way he's playing. So, yep, Jordan's been doing enough for our sides. Grundy, the disappointing one. So, really big game last week, then back to earth this week. Who are the Swans playing next week is probably a good question. Uh, Essendon, bit of a tricky one because uh, especially when Essendon's been playing dual rucks in the past, it's been a restrictive matchup. A uh, bit hard to get a gauge from, or a bit hard to get a read uh, on uh, from the rucks that they played on the weekend because obviously Reeves isn't exactly a big scoring ruck, not that he scored particularly well. I think Goldie's been somewhat okay to score in the past. I have a feeling that the big reason why Essendon's been tough to score against is because of a lack of ruck contest necessarily, like not necessarily because of a... Um, uh, like restrictive ruck style. And so once again, I imagine they're going to be lower on the stoppages compared to other sides. I think they only had 86 on the weekend, which is about their average from last year, ended up being on the lower range. So um, yeah, tough matchup again, probably for Grundy next week, but maybe able to get off the chain a little bit around the ground against uh, Goldie. We'll see. Uh, but I think he bounces back. So do you need to trade him? Uh, in fantasy, he's obviously cooked his um, scoring and uh, cash gem, which is ultimately why we've got him. He's not going to be a keeper more than he has in fantasy, uh, in Supercoach. So if you have something like, if you have Gorn and Grundy, you don't have a cherry. I think like Grundy to cherry this week is probably a, a realistically viable option. Uh, in Supercoach, I'm more likely to hold him than trade him down to uh, cherry as much as I like cherry, just because I think I've got other pressing issues, but it's something you could consider as well. But, you know, it's, I think, important to take out of this. We saw, like, Gorn bad last week, good this week. Grundy good last week, bad this week, right? The, this stuff can flip with these rucks. So, I don't know. I wouldn't necessarily overreact to this one. Uh, but, yeah, think about it. And then Roberts, yeah, um, roll was good. Scoring was tough for this game. Swans had the ball in their forward 50 for most of the game. Uh, like, you know, the first quarter, it was, like, 70% Swans forward half. And of course, Roberts wasn't scoring very well. And then when it was going down their defensive end, that was when he had his bench rotation. There's just stuff like that going on. So when it was down back, he was scoring quickly, just not enough of that uh, this week. And I thought there'd be a lot more. I thought this would be a closer game. So Roberts was on the field for me everywhere, just because I thought that would, you know, that was the game script that I kind of predicted. I didn't expect Swans to run away with it as much as they did, which definitely hurt Roberts scoring. But still, this is salvageable. Very good rookie. If for some reason you don't have him, someone you should be jumping on still is getting kick-ins. All right, game three, the first of the Saturday games, and we have Essendon taking down the Hawks, 107 to 83. A close game for most of this with, I'd say, Hawks getting the better of Essendon, especially in the first half and, and you know, even the third quarter, I thought it was a pretty close contest. Essendon only really got on top in the fourth, uh, and overall, I'd say the Hawks were probably the better side on the day, just inaccurate and wasted their chances. So uh, Essendon a bit lucky to get away with the win, but as a pained Bomber fan, we'll take what we can get. All right, so on the Don side, a little bit to talk about here. Um, and I actually wonder if we should be, you know, starting to highlight some of these players. Actually, this might just be the Essendon Nuffy in me, and we don't need to do that at all. Because, mm. uh, like, we've got Perkins. I don't think it's got the pricing in this. If I click his name, it's not going to show me the pricing, is it? Is it going to show me the pricing? No, it doesn't. Mortz, if you're watching my videos for any reason... Please add the pricing. Maybe when I hover, I could see their prices. Uh, actually, I have a feeling if I go into player tracking, it probably shows it. Because, yeah, like Perkins, I imagine is cheap. Hold on. Let me just... I've got to have a... Ooh, ooh, wrong tab. Not watching KO. Uh, all right. I've got to have Perkins pricing here somewhere, don't I? Apologies. This is what happens when you just rip off the video. All right. He's a 370k forward. We are desperate for forwards. Ooh, all right, a bit of a watch. I mean, it was 24 and 2. It's probably not sustainable. And in fantasy, I assume he's priced awkwardly. Yeah, 607. You're probably not paying that. Uh, there's like billings and other targets to go for, even with the super coach series. All right, so let's not talk about Perkins. Just turn the bomber nuffy off. Uh, like obviously, Parrish going out of this week. Uh, no Hobbs in the side either, who's, you know, returned through the VFL from the shoulder injury. There's still Sheila around as well. Uh, it gave some opportunity to some of the Essendon mids. Uh, and, you know, Merritt scored very well. They didn't end up using Finn to tag him. Uh, you had Durham, who's moved inside, do well. Setterfield did well. Perkins did well. So they all stood up. Uh, but, yeah, Merritt on the watch list. When he gets cheap, we'll try and go for him. Uh, and then, yeah, Sardis was one for the watch list, especially for fantasy is a cheaper option. He came on in the second half. And uh, put up like 62 points in 40% tog and was actually quite instrumental uh, in Essen getting over the top in the end. So one to keep a little bit of an eye on. I, I just think it's hard because Essen do have those other mids to return. 
All right, and then uh, the two ones that people have, including me. So let's start with Zach Reed. Unfortunate injury here. Now, uh, listening to the Scott press conference after the game, what he said was that the trainers, when they had him off um, pre-halftime, they had five to seven minutes with him and couldn't rule him out. So it wasn't an obvious hamstring injury that he'd done. Uh, and they needed the halftime to assess. It sounds like the coaches actually took the decision out of their hands, given Reed's history, and said, just be conservative, even if it's just tightness. So there may be no injury. There may be a small injury. There is probably not a large injury, which I think is the positive. But the thing is, even the the minor strains, I think from the literature I've read are like two weeks minimum. Um, I doubt it would be one week. That would only be for tightness. And, and if it was just tightness, he probably plays this week. So... Uh, yeah, I think good news is that the injury should be at the smaller end, but, uh, yeah, one to, one to keep an eye on for those own him. If it's only one or two weeks, I think, you know, especially with best 18 and whatnot going on and the lack of other defender rookies, I think in Supercoach you can probably hold him, uh, unless, you know, he opens up avenues for him or you miss some other, like you missed Hoare or House or something like that. Um... Uh, but then, yeah, in, in fantasy, like, once again, it's not that many defender options. I, you may just end up holding him. I think this is going to be on the minor end, but we'll get scans this week and hear exactly the extent of the damage. Given his history, maybe if it's small, they're still conservative with the rehab. So a two-week might still be a three or four a week, but we'll see. And then uh, Nick Martin. So, oh, my boy, my boy butchered the ball. Uh, all right. So a couple of things here. A lot of this scoring happened in the first half. And faded off after second uh, in the second half where the side had to restructure. So you had Mackay as the only defender. Cox then had to play second tall. Martin was still playing his role, but then, you know, also playing other positions, it seemed, and not necessarily playing as loose. And you had McGrath rebounding as well. So it feels like his role got a little bit worse in the second half, but I wouldn't expect that to persist. Essendon has Laverde sitting on the sidelines as a read replacement anyway. Um, now, in the first half, I think Martin was playing the way that Essendon wants to play the game. Uh, so they had a lot of short kicking and trying to open it up with some aggressive plays as well. The problem was Essendon wasn't moving up the ground at all. And Martin was still trying to uh, take those kicks rather than what you see other players do. Like Holmes did this, for example, for the Cats. Luke Ryan does it a lot for Frio. Just boot it long. If you boot it long to a contest, that is effective for stats, which means you get lots of points in Supercoach and this score ends up being fine. Instead, Martin was still trying to take the shorter kicks when they weren't really there. And on top of that, just had some bad clangs. Like his first kick in was a disaster. Uh, so do I expect him to butcher it like this every week? No. But we only really saw Essendon start to play the way they wanted to play into the fourth quarter of that game where they still had fresher legs and you saw a lot of the Hawks starting to cramp. And at that point, Martin wasn't the one that was using it because I think some of the way it was turned around and how the first half of the game had gone. So am I worried about this pick? I'd be lying if I said no, it's a 63. But from a fantasy perspective, anyone that has him in fantasy is like very happy. Like 93 is a great score for what he's priced at. Well, not great, but it's good. You know, like it's a good score. Uh, Super coach, you know, if, if it was a 93, would be worried. No. Um, do I think he's going to be minus 30 on his fantasy in terms of ratio every week? No. Uh, so this is a pick that I'm more likely to hold than trade without having looked at my side yet for Supercoach and just see what plays out this week before, you know, making a move on him. Uh, but yeah, a little bit of concern. The ball use was not good, but I thought the opportunity and the role was great. And really, the role was exactly what we were hoping for. It just didn't play out in terms of disposal efficiency in this game. Uh, play the Swans this week and the Swans just crushed pies. So a little bit worried about what scoring for uh, he may, may look like in that game. Oh, but we will see. Uh, and on the Hawks side, I don't think I've got any Hawks this year. Lots on the watch list. Lots I almost started in terms of Amon, um, uh, C-Mac in Fantasy, which I moved off for five. I found the money, which was a very good move in the end. Sisley, because I thought he might get cheap at some point, and he's fast-tracking that the best he can. And then, yeah, Watson as a rookie. Um, look, these small forwards are never relevant, so don't worry about it. Uh, C-Mac is not relevant. He can come off the list. Uh, Amon... Eh... Played his role much better than Martin, but didn't get the same number, like amount of opportunity. So I think if you have him, I'm a, I'm a bit worried because you've, they've got like Ambrosio, Warple, uh, sorry, not Warple, Ambrosio, Weddle, uh, Sicily and Amon all playing down there. So um, yeah, not good. Oh, and just on Sicily, he's been suspended for a week. Uh, they, they're like uh, for his hit on McGrath, I think at quarter time or half time, whatever it was. 
I wouldn't be surprised if they challenge it, but like, I don't know. If you've got him, you have to trade him anyway. This cash loss is awful. Uh, other people are going to give him like 400k if they, if they even want him at that point. Uh, and then Newcomb is going to be the big one people talked about. Now, I was proudly anti Newcomb all preseason. Uh, and the reason why was this is not my preferred um, breakout profile. Someone in the role that they're playing last year, but just like kind of banking on natural improvement. Uh, so I didn't really see like a clear path to him improving. Now, did I expect he would be dropping 60s like this? Uh, it's in his history. He, I think he dropped more like sub 70 games than 120 plus games last year. But to do it first up against Bombers without Parrish, that was a surprise to me. So I think if you started him, this was below what you anticipated as the worst outcome, which sucks. Do you hold or trade? I would be... So if Supercoach, you can probably hold another week. For Fantasy, I'd be throwing him straight out the door now. Uh, Supercoach, even if you just needed money, and this is the only stuff like stuff up you made, I think I think you could trade him as well. Uh, not a fan of him. Don't think he'll be a keeper. So, yeah, move him on. And then, yeah, Ambrosio is the one to watch, I think, for both formats. Could make a lot of money. In Supercoach, I'm somewhat worried he drops like a 60 or 50 next week, and then having a 122, a 50 to 50, like, does he make enough cash? I don't know. I need to look at price projections for that. So I'm a little bit worried about going early in him, even though I freed up money to do so myself. Uh, and then in Fantasy, um, yeah, definitely an option given his price and the 94. Uh, a lot of people have stacked defenses though. And so if you don't have like a Billings, a Fife or a Bonner, they all may be better options than Ambrosio. But uh, yeah, definitely have him on your trade consideration list this week. Going into game four and we have GWS first North, which was one of the unexpectedly very fun games of the round. Uh, the scoreline kind of ended up as you'd expected it. Oh, there's a lot of yellow and blue. Maybe this is why I liked it so much. It's just like lots of fantasy and super coach relevant players. Um, so, uh, fun because both of them play like a fun style, the same with GWS and, and Collingwood. I really like the, the rebounding, um, kind of aggressive out of half back style. And that's what North's trying to do this year as well. It's just fun to watch lots of excitement in the games, lots of back and forth. So yeah, lovely from a viewer perspective, great game. I think for super coach and for fantasy, uh, as well. And North were very competitive up until at least half time. kind of faded away a little bit in the second half where GWS really flexed their muscle a bit. Uh, but given how much they, you know, blew Collingwood off the park last week, North held in there really well. And I think if you're a fan after many years of being in the woods, you've got to start to be happy with some of the talent on the list, especially, you know, a lot of the what's in yellow that I've got um, owned in different formats like Sheasel, LDU, uh, McKercher, I think Cherry did great as a ruck. I know not all North fans bought on him. Um, Dersma, Wardlow, like there's lots of good talent there. Definitely still needed some work on the key tools. I love um, Dill Stevens as a um, uh, acquisition for the wing, but yeah, like promising signs there. Now defense, obviously a big weakness, and maybe that's where we get started on the GWS side. Something that I didn't have highlighted was Hogan. Uh, for fantasy, he's well gone, but for super coach, he's now. Got a couple of very big scores in his um, average. Uh, can go up in price this week uh, for 10K, I believe, and he's up against West Coast. So if you're looking for a quick buck and you have nothing else to do this week, Hogan could be top of your consideration list. I know there is a few in the Discord that were very bro brave and jumped on him already, uh, in which case, well played. Well played. So, yeah. Uh, they'll, they'll make some nice cash. It's a bit like the Tex Walker move from a few years ago. You hope he has another big game. Yeah, the buy sucks and that'll interrupt things. And there's a lot of good forward rookies from the GWS and Gold Coast buys that you're going to have to then play around with. But uh, you can then get him up to an uber premium, I think, pretty quickly. So yeah, one, that's a quick cash play for Supercoach Fantasy, probably gone. Uh, all right, Green and Whitfield. So Green I own in Bolter, I think, but unfortunately... Oh no, I actually got him in Supercoach as well. So two formats and then Whitfield I have in Fantasy uh, and Bolter. So a bit of a split there. Um, Whitfield, I definitely still think in the Fantasy formats can end up being a keeper. He just looks brilliant. This is like the Whitfield role of old. He looks amazing in it. And the way that the Orange Tsunami is now working and running through him as he comes off halfback beautiful if they want to go slow play he's involved uh it's a very nice role injury history obviously the concern with whitfield and the buy a big reason why a lot of people have avoided him but could be a primo in both formats i think definitely in fantasy maybe in super coach too um really enjoying whitfield being back at his best and being healthy 
Green, I said preseason, I don't know how many times. If there was no buys, it would be the easiest selection of the year for the midfield. And he's showing it through two games. Doesn't look like slowing down as well. Um, yeah, huge game out of him. Very impressive. Uh, was what head-to-head with LDU for a lot of the game as well. So it's not like he picked up one of the new boys and was beating up on them. Uh, was going up against the big dogs himself. So yeah, love Green. Um, uh, it's going to be hard. I don't know. We'll see what happens with price um, projections and rises. You may just have to like wait a week. Hope he doesn't go up too much uh, against West Coast, but like they gave up a lot of tons today against uh, Port and then jump on him after his buy. I mean, for fantasy, I'm just going to have to let him go, I think. I've got bigger issues. So yeah, tough one, but he's he's definitely top eight mid both formats and Whitfield top six defender in fantasy, maybe in super coach. Uh, going down here, Green, uh, sorry, Cadman. Um, so great rookie for Supercoach. Uh, worth jumping on now that he's got the 72. Like why we picked Cadman as rookie, similar to like concept to Hogan, which is tall forward playing against a couple of these poorer sides, just, you know, off the basement price. Good chance to make a, a lot of money quickly. And if he fails through these first couple of games, you can kind of jump on after one price rise to someone that hasn't risen. Uh, but yeah, 72 in the system now and West Coast this week, looking good for him. And you'll get to ruck against you know, BJ Williams and Jamison. So he should get a decent number of hit outs, which, you know, he has been doing backup rucking, but not necessarily successfully. Um, this week that may change. We'll see. Uh, green. Yeah. I don't think it'll be a primo. Uh, Ware and Thomas. So Ware has looked very good on the wing. And now that Perryman and Callahan have survived, uh, looks like he should hold his spot, which is good. Unless there's some other injury, which I'm like person returning, which I, I can't think of. Um, in fantasy, he might be too much. Let's have a quick look. Oh, yeah, he's 436K. So really just more of a super coach option. Uh, and uh, unfortunately, I think there's better options to put the hand up. So actually, let's forget about where Thomas, the same boat, looked good, liked his game. I think there's better options. So if you have these two on your side, I'd wait for one price rise and then correct. Um, you know, they may actually pop a really huge game next week and then you end up keeping them for longer. But uh, good rookies, we've just got better ones on option this year. North game, uh, so many North players to enjoy and um, own. Uh, I'm going to go through these quickly. Sheasel is going to be a top six defender, both formats you should have. Uh, LDU is definitely going to be, no, not definitely. He'll be top eight to thereabout in super coach as long as he's fit for fantasy. His game's just less suited to that. But, you know, also they didn't get him involved in the chip mark game as much as I think they ideally would if they're able to control the game a little bit more. There's still more upside at his price, but um, yeah, he's always going to be capped more of a super coach player than a fantasy player. Still a great option, though. Uh, I had fantasies where I have him, I had to trade out of him in super coach to green, which I will cover why in the trade video. Ooh. Uh, Cherry, I've got in fantasy, big 121, which was great. I mean, unfortunately, Gorn went bigger, but uh, yeah, very good score at his price. Looked good today. Um, yeah, did, did very well. I think he's a great option. Um, I have all preseason as long as he stays fit. McKercher, yeah, I mean, uh, someone I benched in some formats just because I'm a bit worried about this matchup, but it didn't really matter. They still used him lots, looked for him lots. Uh, he He's one that actually spreads and gets those marks. You know, same with Sheasel. They played a little bit kick to kick to each other. So, yeah, great rookie. If you don't have him, have to get him. Yeah, you know, both formats. I know some people got off him in super coach. Maybe some didn't too in fantasy. Just get him. You have to get him back in. Uh, Dersma, not an option despite the game. He's not kicking two goals every week, uh, but looks very good. Uh, Wardlaw uh, was amazing in the first half, was matching with LDU, faded away in the second. Uh, he's going to be a bit low time on ground still as they manage him, plus the injury risk. I think there's better options. Uh, Dawson as a sneaky super coach rookie, uh, just given that we don't have many defenders, but uh, yeah, probably not one that you end up going just because of his price and the scoring. Uh, Pink did okay in Supercoach, not in Fantasy. And then uh, oh, Lazaro was okay in Fantasy, not in Supercoach. So in Supercoach, I think Laz is probably one that you end up jumping off at some point. In Fantasy, you can hold him for a little bit longer. I am worried a little bit that he gets like subbed or dropped eventually. But with Goda's injury, um, can maybe he's safer that they've got other, other, other people that can move around. Uh, and then, yeah, Fisher was the big one from this. So uh, 68 Fantasy, 50 Supercoach. I think the interesting thing here is like between Sheasel, McKercher and um, Fisher, I think they've shown that the three of them can have like 300 points a week. Um, I think it just comes down to the distribution. Do I think Fisher's going to be this far behind the other two each week? No. 
Uh, is he going to be a keeper? Mm, I don't know. It definitely wasn't his best game. 50 is surprisingly low. Um, in fantasy, I think he's someone you could potentially trade this week for better options. In Supercoach, I think you wait another week just to see what happens before you make a decision on him. They play Frio this week, I believe. Uh, I think like, yeah, some of, um, I think some of, uh, what Freer played lines, a bit hard to get a read. That game was weird too. Uh, one other thing to actually take out of this game was that the, our stoppages, like the right contests were really low. So 66 for this game, which is like well below the lowest averages last year. So very low stoppage, very high um, back and forth between the, the teams. Um, interesting thing here is like usually you'd think that would hurt um, inside mids, but Tom Green has improved his tank and his spread is good and he actually gets involved in link-up play. And I think that's part of the reason he's going to go to the next level, whether it's high stoppage, you know, nine tackles or able to spread and, and get marks. He's going to stuff the sheet this year. So really positive signs. Um, the thing was like for LDU, this worries me a little bit more. If this is a trend in North's game, they're going to be a lower stoppage side. I do wonder about how much he gets involved in that. I, I think I would be more than this um, typically, but yeah. Uh, only other thing to mention was Powell was an interesting option with Phillips out. Someone I started last year in fantasy and was considering this year if Phillips didn't start and he didn't, but didn't jump on um, one to watch for next week. Cause he may actually end up being relevant forward if they keep, if he keeps Phillips out of the side. G Long St. Kilda, uh, close game in the end. Um, what cats had the ascendancy for the first half. Um, St. Kilda came back late once they were able to get a bit more of their run and gun game on line, but too little, too late danger. Iced the game with a, uh, cracking goal from like 50 outside 50, uh, late into the game too. Like normally you'd expect them to be a little, a little bit fatigued and uh, struggle with that distance, but not very good effort. All right, so in terms of cats, uh, Dempsey is the one that is like 3% owned or something like that in both formats and is a must-have in both formats. In Supercoach, you can wait another week just because you have one more before he rises in price. In Fantasy, you have to go get him now. Uh, I think he will be at something like 300k, start of the week at 250, so already gone up 50k. Um, yeah, he's not going to kick three goals every week, but he was very impressive. To me, this pick reminds me most of Chandler from last year where it kind of came from a little bit from nowhere in the preseason in terms of like, didn't really have a job. Um, but then you see his role on the side and you see how he plays uh, and how they used him. And you're like, yeah, he's going to be a good rookie this year. So I'd be, I'd be very surprised if he didn't end up making uh, a, a good chunk of change for us, uh, playing kind of like that high half forwardish role for the Cats be interesting to see if bigger grounds help him as well uh, in that role. Uh, but yeah, very impressive. He's basically played his way into this side and they're relatively healthy. Like, yeah, they're missing Gary Rowan at the moment, but I think Cats fans would rather play Dempsey than Rowan. So yeah, um, yeah, must have in fantasy and in Supercoach, if you're not bringing him in this week, you're bringing him in next week. Congrats to any coaches that jumped on him. I know a few in the Discord did, so you're well done. Uh, Holmes, interesting one, did have that halfback role. Um, and I think it's going to limit Stewart, but I don't really love him in that role enough to actually want to jump on him. Um, uh, Stewart, yeah, I think he's going to be capped a little bit by that that role. This Saints is one of the best matchups for halfbacks, or it has been historically. Uh, and yeah, they, they like neither of them really went that big. So I think uh, that's a good sign for me that I want to stay away from these two, but maybe it's also the cats let out a lot of this game and I expect that won't always be the case. Eh. Um, but yeah, like he might still end up being a primo for super coach. So definitely on the watch list. Uh, Mana looks good in his limited minutes. Uh, if they get more time, be interesting. Um, Stengel was subbed off because he was cramping, not necessarily that they saw him as playing poorly. So I'm still not sure who would knock out of this side. Uh, and then Jai Clark was interesting. So listening to the Scott press conference, he was asked about Dempsey and Bruin um, stepping out as younger guys, and he went out of his way to mention Clark, unprompted about how he like looks good at the um, top level and how he fit in and all that type of stuff. So even though this is a very poor score from our perspective, no marks, not enough tackles, blah, 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 uh, Scott actually liked his game enough that he may not get dropped, uh, which is kind of interesting. 
but I'm happy to trade him out everywhere just given what we saw out of this game. Uh, the low time on ground, of course, is really concerning as well, sub 60%. Uh, you know, Stingle got subbed off in after three quarters and almost almost uh, beat him up. This is very like Tanner Brun treatment of last year. And yes, he's off a lower base and we saw his high scoring in the preseason. You don't have to trade him, you can hold. Um, but given a, a lot of the other rookies I have went well, this is one that I'm like, yeah, I, I might jump off this. And it'd actually be kind of a blessing for me if he did get dropped. On the Saints side, um, Marshall has shown why he could be a top two or three ruck again this year. It looked very good. Yes, off the matchup against Stanley, uh, but, you know, around the ground work, um, you know, whether it be involved in chains, um, tackling fault work, just very good. Be right up there. Steel is someone that I went from not owning at all to uh, earning everywhere, and he looked good. Um not much more to say, like marks and tackles and possessions, like getting involved around the ground, uh, but still good at stoppage work as well. So um, yeah, at his price, very good option. Not a must have, but very good option. I, probably not going to be a premium in Supercoach, but he can like push close enough. You know, he might be able to get to 110, which I've been pretty skeptical about, but I saw signs out of this game like, yeah, this, this could be an all right pick in the end. Um, let me just have a look at what their stoppage numbers were, the right contest numbers were. So 91, which is probably going to be at the higher end of St. Kilda's games. I do worry if like particularly low ones, whether um, that hurts him, but yep. Uh, Bonner, only only him in one format. I had him in fantasy right up until like 24 hours beforehand, but cut him to fund a whole bunch of other moves, which I think probably worked out net-net good. He looked really good. Um, rebounding off halfback, listening to Lions in the press conference. He said he did some good things and some bad things, or like, he, no, not some bad things, some things he has to improve on as well. So I, he didn't rate his game as high as I thought he might have, especially as uh, a debutante for the for the club. But yeah, like racking it up back there with Nass. Uh, interesting to see what happens once Sinclair returns this week. So for Supercoach, I'd hold off for Fantasy. You kind of have to jump on him now, I think, if you want to. Um, so we are one to consider this week, depending on your other moves and who you got to get rid of. I do think, like, they're, they're, around the ball, they weren't particularly dynamic. And I feel like Sinclair can come in and bring that. But at the same time, like Sinclair, I believe, wants to play back. And having all of Nas, Bonner, and Sinclair back there would be pretty dynamic duo. But I think it hurts all their scoring. It may not matter, though, at Bonner's price. He's priced cheap enough that even if he's doing, like, 80s rather than 100s, uh, he could end up returning value. Wilson as a rookie looked good, kicked the two goals. Um, yeah, uh, will continue to grow. Uh, I think Ross specifically mentioned for him that like what the width of um, uh, the cattery is, you know, like 116 or 119 meters rather than the G, which is like 150 or 160 or something like that. Um, so he's, he's very curious to see him on like a bigger ground. Uh, and you can see why he did a lot of good things. So going to be a great rookie. Going to be fieldable a lot of weeks as well, depending on the matchup. Uh, windy mid pricer option, not really there. And Collard came on as the sub, not really much to talk about there. Uh, all right. Yeah, not really much to talk about else. Okay. Gold Coast Adelaide. So this was the game at the same time. I tried to catch bits and pieces of it, but this is the game that I watched the second least of this um, uh, round. Just because of that clash in games. Uh, and then based on the scoring, what I saw of it, I didn't really want to go back and watch. It was very hard to take much out of it. It was a very wet, soggy game. Uh, and you can see that in the tackle numbers in particular. So I think like league average for tackles is something like uh, 40, 50 a game, something like that. They had 70 or like over 70 each side. And in particular, all heavily concentrated in the mids. So I imagine repeat stoppage, repeat stoppage, repeat stoppage this game, or like tackle as they slap it around to each other. Um, so is like Rao, Miller, Witts, uh, uh, Anderson, Flanders getting like 40 tackles a week? Probably not. Same with the Crows. Like is Laird, Crouch. I mean, Laird's a tackle king. Don't get me wrong. And Rao loves a tackle too. So does Miller. But like these are very inflated numbers. So I think take that into consideration with the scoring. It all concentrated effectively into these mids in a very um, stoppage heavy, yucky game. And without having seen the data from the last few games today, which I can't imagine beat it out, um, this this game had the most rack contests of the round at a bit over 100. 
So lots of, yeah, repeat stoppage work, lots of tackles, um, you know, all the disposals concentrated. So all the halfbacks hurt in some regard and uh, mids benefited. With that said, Gold Coast blitzed them. Uh, like Adelaide came back uh, late in this game and almost had a chance to win. But the the mid scoring here from Rao, Miller, Anderson, Flanders, all 128 plus for the four of them. Very hard once again to get a good read on. Are these primos? Is it game script? It's like a second week in a row. They had a weird game. They blew out Tigers for week one. Hard to get a read. Uh, wet, soggy ball against Adelaide in a high stoppage game week two. I don't know what I'm looking at here. I mean, I think Flanders is going to be a premium. Uh, could Rao, Miller, or Anderson also be premiums? Could all, all four of them be premiums in their lines? Really hard to know. Uh, I'm committed, I think, if you haven't started them to continue not owning them until after the buy. So I'm just going to have to wait and see on what happens. They're going to have a price rise and, and go up a fair bit. But all looking decent, all looking very decent. And then, yeah, Powell, um, I, he's one that could, in Supercoach, be a, a top defender. So just keep an eye on him. But once again, bye. Sexton, um, yeah, I think did well given the conditions of this game. We will see better scores than this in the future. Yuland is a rookie option for defense. I mean, we are desperate. Um, but I think he's, you know, plays small lockdown um, for the most part. Uh, a lot of praise out of uh, Dimmer Hardwick for Yuland on the back of this game. So I think he's kind of cemented his spot into this side playing that role, which is a real positive. But um, yeah, I don't know if it's going to be conducive to scoring going forward. And then uh, Buderick is dead as a pick. On the Crow side... Um, yeah, Dawson, poor game. One that I was off all preseason, uh, just because I was worried about how Crouch in there would affect him. And not a great start. I mean, the conditions aren't exactly conducive to someone like him, who's a good around-the-ground mark, elegant ball user. But he's going to come down in price and potentially someone that we can pick off when the price is right. Crouch had jumped off late, and just because George was really concerned about the low tog, which was has been um, his MO in the past... It's lowish again. Actually, Laird's is quite low too um, for for Laird. So, can he keep up this type of scoring with that lowish time on ground? I think it's going to be difficult. It's going to be a little bit streaky, a little bit inconsistent. But obviously, this type of game style really suits someone like a Crouch. So, not surprised to see him score that well in this game. But I may normalize going forward. Barry, uh, yeah, not a pick. So jump off him if you've got him, especially if you went him over someone like McKercher. And then uh, Burgess was one that had an eye on as a rookie option that could uh, pan out. Like, yeah, probably not going to work. Probably going to be better options just based on what we saw. But once again, not the type of game for a big, tall key position defender. So if you have the luxury of holding another week and waiting and seeing, I think you can. We are moving into the game that I did not see this weekend. Uh, full disclosure, we went out for lunch today. Um, so tracking scores and all that type of stuff. And um, came home to be very annoyed to see that Jack Billings, who I was keen on all preseason and had him in all my sides until Goodwin subvested him in round zero because he didn't know what he had. Only to see them butcher all inside 50s. I cannot believe it. And then they actually played him in his proper position. It looks like this game. 15 marks. That's insane. I mean, that's not sustainable. Um, but yeah, this scoring is not so. So fantasy probably have to get just because the price rises. May have gone up too much already. I don't know. And in super coach, he's on the bubble this week now. So you have to make a decision on whether you want to bring him in or out. I assume based on this, he's not going to be used in the sub vest again or be close to being on the outside of that side, especially when you've got like... Oh, Sparrow. I mean, there's some of these guys are these favorites, though. But yeah, like, that's just nuts. Like, this is what you should have been using him for last week. I, ah! Ah! I, I know dogs give up points in mids and stuff, but that's so frustrating. Um, yeah, gone and I have in fantasy, but obviously having super coach, great score. We hold. Um, if you don't have him in super coach, that's a problem, I would say. Uh, maybe you've got like Marshall already and then Grundy and you, you look at a way to get Grundy to go on. Um, uh, that's potentially possible. But once again, this comes back to who knows, these guys could flip again next week. Obviously, Gorn um, responded after some of the things that were said about him. And from what I understand about English, he was playing through injury as well, which kind of um, made the matchup favorable for Gorn. Actually, like pretty impressive scoring, if that's true. 
Just looking through the rest of the Ds, obviously a few premium midfielders there in Petrarca and Oliver that uh, I've got my eye on for when the price is right, but you know nothing doing now. Salem, uh, sounds like he got that mid-roll, uh, which I thought might happen given who they brought in. Uh, didn't convert it into the biggest score. I saw he started off hot and then faded through this game. So uh, yeah, I don't think it's one that I'm jumping into. If you've already got him, I think you can probably hold and wait and see. You probably have bigger issues, but neither here nor there on that pick. Uh, House and Hoare I have as my defenders in both formats. And yeah, House is going to make some good money. Hoare looks like he'll make some good money. I would expect bigger scores given this matchup. So, you know, curious to hear from others what went on with them. Uh, hopefully they both hold their spots. And then Windsor is interesting here because he was on a like 60, I think, at half time and only finished on the 72. So slow third quarter and then subbed out. Haven't listened to any presses or any like logic as to why they did that. I mean, managing a first game or second game player like that kind of makes sense. Um, but I can't imagine just given the ratio between fantasy and super coaches because he was playing poorly per se. Once again, I think it's a pick that if you have him, great. If you don't have him, I wouldn't be jumping into him. We've got others um, that, you know, look just as good. Oh, and actually that reminds me, I missed one really important player from this game. Sorry, Tom Berry. Um, not for fantasy, I think his price will have already gotten away, but for super coach, he is 160-ish K. He's going to be on the bubble now with a 104. He should be someone that you look at or consider in trade plans this week because he gets the early rise. Uh, on the Bulldogs side, um, yeah, Bont's Bont. Uh, avoided him in fantasy, have him in super coach. That scoring couldn't have worked out pretty much any better for me. Um, I, I, I should have traded Bont to LDU before that game started to have the cash, but it is what it is. I like it. Bond's going to be fine. I'm guessing. Um, yeah. English look for when the price is right. Libba had no interest. I know others did, but uh, he's 32 this year and he comes off a career best year. I'm not interested in that. Uh, what else here? Karmas, um, potentially is a super coach rookie, but I think there's better options. Gallagher, potential is a rookie, but I didn't watch him. So I can't recommend one way or the other. Caulfield potentially was a rookie, but, Scoring in that, I'm guessing he played um, that smaller defensive type role against a didn't go well. I'd be interested to know who his matchup was. I'd go and look at um, fan footy for this to see what they said, but it's become increasingly unreliable on who the matchup is. Just as playing back pocket, okay. Uh, McNeil, yeah, rookie consideration, no good. Harms, lol, no good. I mean, I, he was the mid price I was never keen on um, out of any of them, but the score 35 super coach is just so bad. So, yep, move on, get Billings or someone else. Uh, and then, yeah, Sanders was the surprise here. So, 68 fantasy, um, 43 super coach, and then subbed uh, in like, it must be pretty early in the, or maybe it's like in the third somewhere, just based on this time on ground. Uh, so from the quick comments I read from Bevo, it sounds like it was just like a management thing. Um, you know, they had to pull someone it ended up being him. He had to like clanger kicks. It sounds like just before that, but it was coincidence, uh, which I, I tend to believe apparently like between thinking about activating a sub and actually activating, it takes some period of time. So um, yeah, I can believe they already made the decision and then he had a couple of mistakes. Uh, but it sounded like they were, t like the way Bevo talked was like talking about getting him up and prepared for this week. So obviously like this is a little bit of a concern and one we have to keep an eye on. Uh, just, you know, does he get another game? I can't imagine they drop him. They still got McCray to come back, but I can't imagine he's being dropped. Uh, like drop harms before him or something. I don't know. So yeah, uh, yeah, just wanted to keep an eye on uh, for sure. The... Matchup this week for them is Gold Coast, which is obviously a tricky one. And it's later. It's a Sunday game. Um, so Sunday, 1 p.m. There's only two games after it. Makes it a little bit tricky if he is someone that actually ends up being a sub and you have to trade out. Because uh, you're not going to be able to. In fantasy, your trades will be locked in by then, almost guaranteed. In Supercoach, yeah, probably the same boat. Um, but at least he won't be going through the price rise. So... Uh, I'd like harder to field him this week. Gold Coast has been tough with Stan over the last couple of games. And uh, given you got subbed out, I think that's someone that'll be benching this week. All right, two games left to go. And then we're going to see if Fantasy and Super Creature open and get into those videos. Excellent. All right. Uh, Port against West Coast. Um, Port got up by 50 points here. West Coast definitely looked more competitive than previous years to my eye with some of their um, more experienced players. Uh you know, being fit and able to play this game. And you had, you know, some of the 
some of the younger guys, it's clear that they've you know been playing for a year now. Um, so just generally better effort and better consistency throughout this game for West Coast. Uh, the only two that I have as relevant are Yo and Reed. I own both of them. Yo, I th- was pretty happy with. The time on ground is low. The 70 tog, not not thrilled with that. But once again, played out another full game and didn't look bothered in doing so. Um, yeah. Uh, I, I think he's scoring. Like, he'll be better for the run, as they say. Um, Port dominated this game, so it's worth to note. Like, if you look at total fantasy points here, 1162. I haven't actually checked what the last game's total was. But the 1162 is so low. It is so low. Yeah, okay, much higher. So the next lowest after 1162 was Tigers at 1320, and then every other team was 1400 plus. So they still had like 250 points lower than what you'd expect other teams. 250 over uh, like 22 players. It's like 10 plus points you'd expect, and you wait more towards those that should get more. Like... I think against other teams, if this was like an average scoring thing, this is probably higher for both of these. But Port have been like fairly restrictive, I believe, from a fantasy perspective uh, and even super coach perspective as well. You know, they, they got 1,900 points out of the 3,300 pie, which is crazy. So yeah, um, scoring wasn't great from Yo, but I think this will be like, will come good. And then Reed, I really liked what I saw. Once again, low time on ground, managed a fair bit, but he is going to be good. So I'm um, happy to have both of them. Wouldn't be moving off them. I uh, probably wouldn't be moving into them necessarily though either. On the port side, I remember it was the first time I did it backwards, sorry. Uh, all right, so yeah, rosy Butters both look good. Picking up where they left off from last year. Maybe they would have expected bigger scores just given that they're beating up on West Coast, but he's what it is. Uh, Houston looked good. Um, I think he's maybe less likely to be a top option this year than in previous years. You've got um, Farrell and Burton back there as well, who looked equally as capable. Uh, equally is probably not right, but were very capable coming off half back. And I just do wonder if they shared around a bit more, not as reliant on Houston, can be using that Mr. Fix It role. Um, so if I get me wrong, still think he's going to be good, but maybe not as good as what we saw last year. Um, and then, yeah, Wines. Moved off him in Supercoach for Yo for, once again, the reason I'll explain the trade video. It doesn't make sense on the surface. Uh, concerning here, he didn't get as much midfield time as I thought he would. Moved around a little bit. It still played predominantly CBA mid, and he might have actually, like, uh, I, I think it was Horn Francis that led CBAs. And then Wines ended up being fourth, which was a little bit of a flip to what we saw in the preseason. Uh, but this also wasn't his type of game, I don't think, where... It wasn't necessarily the highest stoppage game. Um, a lot of free-flowing stuff. And he did get involved a little bit. Like, how many marks has he got? Oh, two. Okay, I thought he, I thought he had more. Um, but yeah, it, wasn't, it, it didn't feel like it was a very high stoppage game, which suits his style. Same with Yo. Um, so yeah, a little bit of a concern there. Uh, for Supercoach, 94 is fine. Uh, I imagine you just try and hold him if you've got him until like Flanders or someone's off by. And I think that's a perfect off-ramp. For fantasy, a little bit trickier. I think he could be someone you potentially move on this week for others, uh, just because with the lower time on ground, you've got others that get involved, like Butters and, and Rosie, a little bit worried about that. Um, uh, and then Yo, like the other uh, thing with Yo, he played a lot of defensive mid, wasn't hunting the ball as much as I'd like, and that's probably going to hold him back a little bit too. So hopefully they let him off the leash a little bit, uh, letting more like Reed and, and uh, um, Kelly hunt while Yo did more defensive stuff. And then Meade out as having a cheeky consideration on in fantasy. He did 60, which would have been, I think, better than Cam McKenzie, but um, for cheaper as well, but uh, went five in the end. Probably get removed off that list this week. Uh, and then last game, Frio line. So line started off strong four goals, and then I think Frio hit him back with eight and kept going. So um, once again, really weird game on the scoring here. So Rong had 25 touches in the first half, and they still put no attention into the second half, ended up with 21 more. Looked a beast. Um, yeah, has maybe gone another step on where he was last year, just in terms of progression, uh, which was, yeah, phenomenal to see. And I had concerns, at least with like Fife and Young going in there, how that affects Brayshaw and Sarong. Brayshaw, probably. Uh, not Sarong. Not Sarong. At least not through one game so far. Crazy. He wants the ball. He was everywhere. This is a high watch for premium status everywhere. I don't know what I can do about it now. Uh, we'll have to wait and see. Maybe there's some down games coming, but you'd thought, you'd have thought that uh, Lions would be a tougher matchup, and it just wasn't the case today. They were very easy to go through, especially with no Neil. 
Uh, Ryan junking it up in defense and I guess not having like Young or Chapman or anyone else like Clark really being the the second um, ball user back there helped him, especially in this game. He was allowed to play loose. He was intercepting. He was uh, running for cheap kicks and marks. He was taking kick-ins. It was pretty gross to watch. It is if prime Luke Ryan game. So if he's durable, he's going to be right up the top end of defense this year. Could even be as high as D2 behind Dacos, I think. is that disgusting. Uh, Jackson played good, for sure. Um, the highlight of his game for me, though, was the marking around ground. And I think this is really interesting because Brio had a number of injuries today if you did not watch the game. Uh, so they had Brennan Cox who's playing forward, did a hammy. He'll be out a few. You had Oscar McDonald who was playing defense, who went down with a knee. You had Carl Warner playing uh, like defense who got KO'd. And then you had one more, who was it? Who was it that did another knee as well? Or was it just the three? It might have been just the three. Um, but the reason why this is potentially interesting for Jackson is with Cox going down, I do actually wonder, or like, and, and Jackson looking amazing in the right, uh, in the, in the marking and forward line today. I do wonder if they actually execute that idea of reading in and then moving Jackson forward as early as next week, uh, because he was good in the contested marking. It may not be the case. They may move in, um, like, uh, Tabana, uh, or, um, like, Voss or something like that instead and just play another forward and keep it as is. But I wouldn't be surprised if, if Reedy um, came in, if they wanted to play second ruck and actually just move Jackson forward where they had been training and, and what they'd been talking about. Clark, if you've got him in fantasy, like will make money for sure. Definitely the second option. And uh, when they're possessing it in half back, like they were today, he's going to do well. Five. Oh my boy. I've been talking about him all preseason. Been releasing shorts and little memes about him, and he delivered today. He looked very good. Uh, I could have had more points as well. Like, Brayshaw missed him for, like, a simple plus six kick. Um, at the end there, Jackson missed him for a handball. He could have had another shot on goal. Uh, so this could have been a ton in both formats easy. It's not going to be this good every week, but uh, Fife is still a contested beast and still has an ounce for the ball. The thing that he doesn't do, which you, you like what a Sarong does is like Sarong and Brayshaw are running for those 15 meter chip outlet kick options. Fife doesn't really do that. So he's never going to be like, I don't expect this every week. This is a particularly good game. Lots of Freo tons, but he looks good. Excited about, uh, excited to own him for sure. Uh, yeah, Brayshaw did not necessarily look that good. Pretty interesting score. Uh, all right, then these two are actually interesting. So in fantasy, Sharp looks like a very good option. In Supercoach, he may end up being an option as well. See how he goes next week. Really liked his game. Uh, was impressive uh, on the run, on the outside. Did some some nice things. I think, uh, yeah, got to be happy with that, filling in for a position that Freo has been weak at, just given what they lost. And then, uh, hey, Deno, uh, look, playing the defensive mid of the four of them, and you can see that in his tackle numbers, like very much, uh, yeah, doing a lot of the defensive groundwork. Now, he gave away four frees and had 11 clangers, and 11 clangers, it's got to be up there with the most of anyone this weekend. Um, you'd think like uh, like Nick Martin, for example, who people absolutely like hammering into him about his ball use would have had a lot of clangers. He had four. So for Hayden Young to end up with 11 just kind of shows how things went against him uh, today. He will not have such a poor ratio each week I, I can guarantee you that he's not as bad of a user as what this score reflects. So for Supercoach, I'm not worried. And for Fantasy, he put up a 95. Can't complain about that. Uh, Emmett, sneaky option as a rookie, but off the list. And then McDonald was cooking a little bit as a defender, but he's off the list. Same with Warner, actually. Um, uh, I mean, Warner got concussed, so he might be back in a couple of weeks. But yeah, looking at these as potentially like um, rookie options, but uh, yeah, not, not with the injuries. Uh, Dunkley just been so, so I thought he might go to the next level this year. I like, I, I honestly hardly noticed him for this score. I like surprised he had nine marks and eight tackles. Um, so quietly accumulating, but not great lines, um, low time on ground, probably affected by the fact he got bumped, um, early by Fife and got a cut on his head, had to come off like instantly, uh, for blood rule, managed to get to an 81 in the end. Uh, and this is in like a very poor game for the lines. 
So if you've got him, great. If you don't have him, I don't think you're that worried about him. And Loman, once again, a rookie option that was considered, but uh, off the list after what we saw this game. So that is my uh, recap of all the games this week, giving you the quick lowdown on what I saw and the players. And thank you if you've made it to this part of the video. I'll be seeing you in the next videos. Once again, going through trades for Supercoach and Fantasy as some of the considerations and philosophy. Look forward to talking to you then. Peace. Thank you.